So we're in the Jesus trip, and we are in Kings. We've been reading Kings. Last week, we talked about Elijah, and this week, I want to talk about Elisha. Last week, we prayed for, I was so amazing to see all the people under 35 in this house. We prayed for all them, and the most important thing to any generation is the next generation. It really should be, and it's so good to pray for the next generation and tell them, it's time. You're not waiting to arrive. It's your time now, so be released to get involved and be a part of things, but we started last week talking about Canada, and even as Canada, Canada has a destiny, and a young Cho, a South the Korean pastor, pastors the biggest church in the world, millions of people. And uh, he came to Canada and he said, Canada and the Canadian church is going to rise up once again and go to the four corners of the world and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Say the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many know that right now there's a great big revival on the gospel of Jesus Christ? There's believers that are hearing the gospel for the first time and going, oh my goodness, the good news of Jesus over my life is really amazing. And they're realizing that I've been spending years and years going to behavior classes and and behavior modification courses, and I'd forgotten how incredible my salvation is and how amazing the grace of God is. And there's a massive revival on that. It's like I've got so many people are saying, I came to Impact and I feel like I got saved again. I just, just feel like, oh my goodness, I, I realized all my life I got saved, but then I spent all kinds of time trying to be approved to God. I, he saved me, but then I said, I tried to keep myself saved for years. I was, I was okay, you saved me, now I'm going to stay saved. And, and, but the salvation that they heard was fragile, and, and it, was, it was full of works and effort and behavior modification. Try harder, do better. And uh, it's amazing to hear the good news, how powerful it is today. Say Amen. 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 So I'm so excited about that, because, and I believe that. So many prophets, I mean, there's a long, long list of prophets who believe that there is a last day move, and Canada will go first, you know? And I'm like, wow, I'll, I'll take that, you know? And, you know, war, good warfare, you'll have success if you trust the prophets. And uh, I believe that word, and I, I, I pray about it. We got a big map of the world in there, and I pray for the whole thing. The Lord said, how much do you want? I said, I want it all. I want it all. I want this whole globe to be flooded and saturated with your glory. Big, you're not coming back to a, a sad manifestation of you. You're not coming back to a world that is dark and miserable, and you're going to pull a few people out and get us out of this mess. He's going to come to an earth flooded and filled to saturated with the glory of God. As surely as I live, says the Lord, and he does live, the earth will be saturated and flooded and filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Will some people reject him? Yes, some people will still, even in the face of his coming, say, no, I don't want you. How stupid is that? But so many, the last feast is the feast of harvest, and it's not going to be little. It's going to be big, because I'm going to bring many sons to glory many sense. Amen. So Leonard Ravenhill said about Elijah, he said, the world is crying out, where's the God of Elijah? But the answer is that he's always been, he's where he's always been. The question is, where are the Elijahs? Because, you know, really God did it all. He filled it all. Jesus came, did it all. He did all he could. He went high five to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, boom, and it's our turn. It's our turn. You know, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed fervently, and it didn't rain. But a man just like us. And I mean, he was in an old covenant. We're in a new covenant with way better promises, a way better priesthood, way better commandment, way better commission. And God has blessed us. And I tell you, what these guys did is nothing compared to what God has invested in us. Amen. Elijah went, threw his cloak over him. Elijah went, he found Elisha plowing in the lowest place, in the hardest place, he found Elisha plowing. If you think you're plowing in the lowest and the hardest place, you're a candidate for God. Elisha was plowing in a hard spot, a difficult place, the lowest place, but he was very wealthy family because he had 12 yoke of oxen, and I mean, he was plowing with the 12th yoke, and, and, and here it is, he's busy working, amen? You know, you know where God finds candidates to serve his purpose? They're working. They got a job. And they're faithful in that place. They're engaged in where they are. They're not like, oh, I don't want to do nothing. I just want to, when's the anointing for my life going to come? You know what? Engage in what you're doing right now. And if you're faithful in the lane you're in right now, God is going to visit you in a big, big way. And, you know, the lane you're in right now may be your destiny. Enjoy it. Suck the life out of it. Be the glory of God where you are. You're a world changer not waiting to become. You're a world changer now. Don't have destination disease. Don't have a disease that someday I'm going to be awesome. You're awesome right now. You're awesome where you are. You're planted in a beautiful spot to be fruitful. Don't have your eyes shrouded and not see that there are powerful miracles all around you every day. 
Amen. You know the most beautiful picture I have Tuesday morning when I come for the first time after Sunday? I walk into this room and there's nobody here but empty chairs. And I say, thank you, Jesus. The body of Christ is all over the city today revealing your glory. It's such a good, good thing, isn't it? Isn't it? All right, I got to go quickly, Pastor. So he comes, he sees Elisha, and he walks over to Elisha, and he throws his mantle over him, and then he walks on. And then Elisha says, hey, hang on, let me, could, I understand what that means, but could I bury my family first? Could I finish the season with them, get my inheritance, and then, then I'll follow you later on. And literally one translation says, Elijah said to Elisha, what have I to do with you? Well, this translation, interesting enough, says, go back and think about what I've done to you. Think about it now. Think about this. I just took my mantle and put it across you, and then I walked on. Think about what just happened to you. Think about it. And when he thought about it, he went, yeah, that's pretty awesome. So he went and he killed all the dad's cattle, at least all the ones that were plowing, burned all the tractors and all the farm equipment. And dad's out going, oh, what's going on out there? He just trashed the whole thing, and he went and he served. The word for serve was he washed the hands of Elijah. So that's Samuel. That was his calling, and that's where the whole big Samuel story, that's Elisha. That was the first calling of Elisha. Think about what he's done to you. Think about it. I want you to think about that. Second Kings 2, 1, all the way to 15, it says, When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you? Now, he'd been serving Elijah for years, following and caring for him and, and serving him. And then Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken away? I love that. I mean, you already threw your mantle on me, which meant I'm going to be your successor, and yet here we are where that transition is taking place, and you're asking me what I want. But I love that because he said, I want you. He's literally saying, do you get it? Do you want your destiny? Do you want your future? And he didn't say, look, I'm going to give you my mantle. Now it's time to get the mantle. No, he said, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? What does he want? He said, he said man, he, and he, I love this because he said, I don't want just a little bit. I don't, I don't want. He says, I want a double share of your spirit. I want a double share of your spirit. I don't just want what's on you. I want a double share of what's on you. I want the crown prince anointing. I want, I want the fullness. I want, I want the double piece. I want, I want the portion of the firstborn to come upon me. I want that anointing in my life. So really quick now, first thing he did was he burnt the plow and he followed it. He became a servant. He walked along and he said, you alone are my source. The second thing in this journey he's in from 2 Kings 2, 1 to 6, they all knew, everybody knew it's time for Elijah to go. Everybody knew, but when he got to Gilgal, he turned to him at Gilgal and he said, stay here. And Elijah was like, I know it's time for you to go. I want the mantle. And he said, I want you to stay here at Gilgal. And Elisha said, you know what, no matter what, I don't care what you're saying, I'm not going to take my eyes off of you. But you see, what he's saying is, I want you to remain at Gilgal, meaning I want the message of Gilgal to be present in your life every day. I want the revelation of Gilgal to be something that's established in you. I want it to stay there. I want it to remain in you. And Gilgal, Gilgal is, is in Aramaic, it's Golgotha. In Aramaic, it means to roll back. And, in, and Golgotha is the place where Jesus Christ was crucified. And he says, I want you to always have established in your heart and in your mind as a first thing. I want the revelation of the work of the cross to be something that you all will see. Just like the Shunammite said, said the revelation, I hold the revelation of the cross over my heart. He says, I want this to be a place where you are established. And people, you need to be established in what it meant at the cross, the finished work, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I want you to own it. I want you to understand it. I want that revelation to be clear in your heart and in your mind. Here's someone saying, I want to share a double portion. He said, stay there. And you got to stay in a place where you know what that means. You got to go to Gilgal, then Bethel. Bethel is the house of God, the house of bread. You need to be established in the house of bread. You got to stay there there. He says, I want the double portion. I'm not staying here. Well, you need to stay there because that revelation of Bethel, that's why you're here this morning because you got the revelation of Bethel. If you got the revelation of the house of bread, if you got the revelation of what it is to be in that place of anointed feeding, of feeding on the word of God and the revelation of that, when you got a revelation of Bethel, the house of God is a value in my life. That's your journey 
in the double portion. He says, then he said, you got to see Elijah go. He says, you got to see me go. You see, that's not even up to me. So you want the double portion. I believe you want it. But are you willing to see me go? And you see, there was all kinds of things that took place, winds and all kinds of stuff. There was lots of distractions. But he had to keep his eye on Elisha. And he saw Elisha go. And he saw that the mantle fell. And he got the mantle. And Elijah was basically saying, I believe you are the one. I believe that you're my successor. But it's a choice of God. The anointings are choices of God. And you've got to see me go. And that's a God thing. And you've got to have that revelation for yourself. And when that mantle falls, you've got to pick it up. Am I preaching too fast for anybody? Man alive. you got to see him go. Then the next thing is when that mantle comes, you got to tear your robes. Because you can't put that mantle over top of you. I can't say, well, I want God's purpose in my life, but I want mine too. I want to serve God with my whole heart, but i got a couple of things that I'm interested in. I'm going to do a little bit of double dosing. I'm going to you know, dip in God and dip in my own desires. you got to rend your own garments. If you're going to put his on, it won't fit if you want to insist on your own way being a part of it. That was all right. It was good. For some of you, it might have been. Anyway, I thought we were a grace church. We are. We're all about grace. And the grace of God, it empowers you to say no to a selfish life. The flesh will never do that for you. Better behavior modification will never bring you into a place of freedom and liberty to be used by God. But the grace of God will. It'll fully equip you. You see, it, then you got to strike the water. And it's like, where? Lord God, the, the is isn't even in the passage. It's actually in italics in the authorized version because the is isn't there. The translators threw it in. But he said, where, Lord God of Elijah? Not where is the Lord God of Elijah, but he had the anointing. And he literally was saying, where do you want me to start? Where, Lord? And he took the mantle and he struck the water. And boom, miracle number one. Elijah ha- had eight miracles Elijah had 16, total double portion. So burn your plow, follow and embrace. See Elijah go, tear your robes, strike the water. And then when he came across, everybody looked at him and they could tell tangibly and visibly the spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah. Say hallelujah, I'll move faster. All right, so you got to see all that go. So that was all boom right there. Elijah performed twice as many miracles. Miracle, say miracle. A violation of natural law, divine intervention in the ordinary course of nature. Miracles. Say, I was born for miracles. I was born for miracles. Hallelujah. Man, I'm telling you. Elisha wanted miracles. Earnestly desire the gifts. Earnestly desire that you would prophesy, but earnestly desire. One of the gifts of the Spirit is working miracles. And we're to desire to be miracle workers. I believe in miracles. Stephen believes in miracles. He saw somebody under a a, a tormenting situation, and he believed that he is a dispenser. Hey, I'm a dispenser of miracles. There's one read at night now. Jesus. You are a dispenser of heavenly favor everywhere you go. That's why you're there. If Jesus just wanted to get you to heaven, it would have been, I accept Jesus as my Savior. Whoa. No, now you accept him as your Savior. Now you are commissioned to loose the glory of God everywhere you go. You're not waiting to get out of this mess. You are commanding the mess to disappear. All right, so miracles. Mark 9, 23. If you can believe all things are possible to him who... Any believers here today? All things are possible to you. Bill Johnson said it's abnormal. Say abnormal. It's abnormal for a Christian not to have an appetite for the impossible. Hey, an appetite. Oh, I want to see miracles today. An appetite for the impossible. It has been written in our spiritual DNA to hunger for the impossibilities around us to bow to bow. That's why you enjoyed singing that song so much today. You know that the name of Jesus changes everything. So it's written in your DNA. F.F. Bruce, he said this. F.F. Bruce said, while the miracles served as signs, they were not performed in order to be signs. They were as much a part and parcel of Jesus' ministry as was his preaching. They weren't seals affixed on the document to certify the genuineness. They were integral elements of the very text of the document. See, Jesus, when he was on the boat and they had the storm, he said, did you not learn anything about the sign and the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. See, the loaves and the fishes wasn't, ooh, that was cool. The loaves and the fishes was a lesson. 
is they didn't understand that I just participated in authority over creation, and now I'm in a storm, and I did not get the lesson. I didn't get the revelation that this storm also is subject to me. Or did you not understand the miracle? He didn't say, did you not understand the teaching? He said, did you not understand the miracle? Because the miracle isn't just, hey, I'm taught for a while, so let me just put a seal on that. A miracle. No. And Jesus didn't just do those things. Although that did attest to who he was, that wasn't the only reason for it. That was a part of the everyday ministry of a believer. It is awkward, abnormal, strange not to have personal testimonies of where God has used you and miracles have flown through your life. That is odd. It's not odd for it to happen. It's odd for it not to happen. I went to a church that believes in miracles, right? Can you believe it? They believe in miracles. Well, don't you? Which Bible are you using? Speaking of Bible, here we go. Acts chapter 2, 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God by miracles, signs, and wonders, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. Hebrews 2, 3 to 4, spoken by the Lord, spoken, word spoken, that word was spoken and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. John 10, 37, 38, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe in me. If I go to church and there's never a sign, never a wonder, never a miracle, never any evidence of the power of God moving on anybody, don't go there. That's a paraphrase. Let me read it again so you can understand it. Jesus himself said, if I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe in me. Jesus, Jesus, who had wisdom, taught, had incredible revelation about the Word of God, said, everything I've said... Don't even listen to it or pay attention to it unless there have been miracles. You could have the most wonderful teachers of the word in the world, but God says if there's no miracles, that was prophetic right there. (laughs) Believe the works. What? Believe what? Though you do not believe in me, he says, listen to that. Though you do not believe me, he said, believe the works. Believe the works. Believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. Jesus is saying that the miraculous is directly related to the revelation of the Father and the revelation that I am in him and he is in me. Say amen, somebody back in the back row. All right, thank you very much. All right, John 14, 11, 12. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. Now, the greater works clearly are television sets and internet and the fact that we'll send the teaching of God all over the world through satellites. Jesus said the works that I do. What works did he, he said the works that I do, you will do. So some people are like, well, we don't need those anymore because we've got really cool works today. No, the works that Jesus did, you're going to do and and greater works. Amen. Miracles. 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 Hallelujah. Mark 6, 20. And they went out and they preached everywhere. This is the disciples flooded with the Holy Ghost. They went out preaching everywhere. And the Lord working with them, confirming the word through accompanying signs. Amen. Acts 4. I mean, they got attacked. They got thrown in jail. James lost his head. Peter got released. They decided to pray. God, get us out of here. It's getting ugly. People don't want you. Please come soon because it's getting messy. You don't know how bad it is down here. Please, quickly, get us out of this mess. Amen. Acts chapter 4, that's not what they said. Acts chapter 4, 29. Grant your servants that we may boldly speak your word. We've heard them rage. You've heard that they want to do. They want to shut you down. But now give us boldness. Give us boldness to speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through your name, the name of your holy servant, Jesus. It says the whole place was shaken. They were all filled with the spirit and they all went out and spoke the word of God with boldness. And it says the apostles went out and everybody who came to town, they were all healed. You know, when when you're feeling pressure, you're not getting the manifestation and people are coming against you, don't wax weak and don't pull back on your message. Pray for boldness and say, come on, big fella, I'm going to say the truth and you back it up with power. 
say. And then you go do it. All right, thank you, Pastor. Acts chapter 14, two to three. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, poisoned their minds against the brethren. So we thought it's not a really good place to plant a church. So we moved on down the road. That's not what it says. It says, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, we stayed there a long time. This is tough. We're going to stay longer. This is hard. We got a lot of opposition. Yeah, we're going to persevere. 29 years I've pastored this church. 29 years this May. Stayed there a long time. Yeah. George is saying he's 29. I said I started pastoring this church when I was 27. Just saying. But the believing Jews stirred him up, so they went. They stayed a long time speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace. Bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Take a look at your hands. Take a look. Look at that hand. Look at that. Look at that. That hand is a, a that, that hand is a vehicle. It is a living conduit to the heavenly realm. That hand is like a Coke machine. Coke, miracles. People can come to you, press miracle, out comes miracle. Your hand is a dispenser of heavenly favor. Wow, I tell you, I thought about this meeting beforehand and I thought they'd be a lot more excited than this, but I always overshoot. Because I believe, I believe. Okay, so... Uh, Romans chapter 15, 18, and 19. By my message and by the way I worked among them, they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders, by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, in this way, with word and deed, show and tell, in this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. Yeah, we just have the word. We're really good at the word. We, we, we are a church that is really awesome in the word. Any miracles? No. Then you didn't fully preach the word. Oh, no, we do. We, we, we pride ourselves in being really, really good at that. Miracles. Miracles. There, there's people who think this church, they're all just crazy down there. They don't preach the word down at Impact. They're all just saying and act crazy. You know. <laughs> so you know that. People, people say, oh, Impact people, they're all, all kind of spacey out there and crazy. You know, you come to this church, you're going to hear more word in this church than you do pretty much anywhere. Because, you know, you're supposed to preach the word. You know, when you get revelation of the word, it doesn't explode in you. When you get the why and you understand the how, then you're going to start to do some crazy stuff. Hey! Hey! Just a minute. So anyways, as I was saying, if you understand, if you get it, oh, oh, uh, the plants got more excited. Anyways, <laughs> my wife's saying, behave, be nice, keep smiling. Can I get a hallelujah, Pastor Cheryl? Can I get a glory to Jesus, Pastor Cheryl? Glory to Jesus. Oh, man, I'm telling you. Prophets only without honor in his own house. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, deliver me from being so needy. <laughs> amen. I got an amen out of that one. That was good. Right there. All right. Come on. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So John 12, 34. The people, the people, the people answered him and they said, we, this was, People who come for the feast, people who are, you know, outside of Jerusalem coming for the feast, and they're listening to Jesus. Where's that Jesus guy? We want to hear him speak. And then they came to hear Jesus speak. But then they said, they answered, hey, we have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. So how can you say the Son of Man should be lifted up? I mean, who is the Son of Man then? Because what you're teaching is wrong. See, they understood, their understanding from the law, their understanding from the Old Testament was that the mantles, the anointing, the, 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 the Meshiach, the, the, the soaking anointing of God that makes stuff happen, it always stays here. But Jesus saying, I am the fulfillment of that, and I'm going away. And they're like, 
Well, you can't be the anointed one if you're going away because the anointing stays. And they really, they didn't understand because the Bible talked about it a lot, but they still thought that the messianic kingdom would be one that would be set up with him and he would stay. But they didn't understand that he was going to go so that he could take that same anointing that's on him and deposit it on everyone. So you had a mantle that was only on a few and only stationary and local. But I'm going to go with that mantle. I'm going to go through the grave. I'm going to destroy sin. I'm going to destroy Satan. I'm going to destroy every obstacle. And then I'm going to go to heaven and say, did it, Father? Now flood everybody with the anointing. And so they didn't get that big picture. But they thought, because the anointing has to say, all right, back to Elisha. That was the start of Elisha's ministry. Amazing ministry. Some really cool miracles. We don't have time to preach on them all, although they're all really, really awesome. The axe floating and all the stuff. So many great miracles. But here we are at the end of his ministry. When Elisha was ill with the illness. Now, this is interesting because it says when he had his last illness, when it says when Elisha, literally it's the same word used in Isaiah 53 for grief. So when Elisha was loaded down with grief, when he was at that last place of grief, King Jehoash came to him, and it's almost a type of when Jesus went to the cross, and the grief and the heaviness of the world was laid upon him. See, King Jehoash went and visited him, and he wept over him, and he said, my father, my father, I see the chariots of chariots of Israel, and he cried out, you're departing, I know it's time for you to go, but I want the mantle, because I know that you haven't given the mantle to anybody, and the only way we can get anything done as God's people is, we need the anointing. And so he knew that. He wasn't stupid. He said, look, if we're going to go forward, if we're going to go forward as a nation, you haven't given that mantle to anybody. I want it. I want the anointing because we can't do anything without God's touch in our lives. That's what he was saying. And so he came to Elisha when Elisha's about to depart. Just like Elijah put the mantle on Elisha, this king is saying, I want the mantle. So he said, I want the mantle. All right, you following? So next thing he did was he he came and he said, Elisha told him, get the bow and get some arrows. Why did he tell him that? Because that's what he was carrying. That was his preferred weapon of choice. And he had that, get the bow, get some arrows. The king, he did as the king told him and he put his hand on the bow and then Elisha put his hand on that. So you gotta, if you're gonna be used by God, you gotta pick up your gifting. You gotta pick up what God's equipped you with. Pick it up, celebrate it, love it. Pick up that anointing in your life and then get the hand of God on it. So he put his hands on it, and then the hand of God was on it. And he's saying, all right, I'm going to saturate, going to soak you with power and purpose. Next thing he said, open the windows. And he opened the windows. So you got to remove barriers to release that anointing in your life. And then he said, shoot. Say, shoot. Shoot. So the, in the authorized version, it says, the Lord's victory and victory over a ram. The Lord's victory and victory over all those enemies. It's like there's twofold thing there. That arrow, when you release your anointing, when you release your faith, it does something in the spirit realm, and then it brings manifestation in the physical realm. And that's what happens. That's why the and is important. It's not in this translation. But when you release that in faith, something changes in the spiritual world because that's where it's really going on. And when you release your faith, where the background, whatever's at work behind it, the arrow of God touches that, and then you get the manifestation in the earth. So when you release your gifting, when you release what God's planted in you, it's going to do those two things. Can you say faster, pastor? All right, so then he said, now pick up the other arrows and strike the ground. So he picked them up and he struck the ground three times. But the man of God was angry with him. You told me to get the arrows and strike the ground. I did what you told me to do. What are you so mad about? Because in your quiver, there's at least five or six arrows. So when he shot an arrow, then he took the next arrow, he went tap, 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 and there were still arrows. He could have kept tapping, but he decided, good enough. And the man of God was angry. Romans 12, 1. Never. Say never. Never be lacking in zeal in your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. If you got anything left in your quiver, empty the whole thing. And when you just go, oh, tap, 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 tap. I got to tap, tap, God. He said, you would have had total victory over all your enemies, but now you'll only win three victories. And that's all they won. Historically, that was it. So what do we know? What we know is, is that he did not lay hold of the mantle. Isaiah 60, it says, of the government and of his peace, there shall be no end, and the zeal of God will accomplish it. Passion. 
If you're going to serve God, do it with all your heart. If you're going to say amen, say amen. 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 Watch the clock now. Amen. Arr. I mean, he was looking for passion. He's looking, he's going, okay, you want this? You want to lay hold of this? Never be lacking in zeal when you serve the Lord. Then, then he said, come on, strike the ground. He said, you should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten a ram until it was entirely destroyed, but now you'll be victorious only three times. Then Elisha died and he was buried. Boom. Later on, it says a group of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. This was at the time of Passover. This right at the time of Passover. Grief, Passover, Jesus bore Passover cross. Jesus bore our grief, bore our sorrows. At the time of Passover, some of the Israelites were burying a man, and the man said, I want to be buried in Elisha's tomb. Either he was related to Elisha, he was of the family of that, or he literally said, I want to be buried in that tomb. But when they're ready to bury that guy in that tomb, they... Uh, took him, and it says these raiders came, so they hastily threw the corpse in the tomb of Elisha, and they fled. But as soon as the body touched Elisha's bones, the dead man was revived, and he jumped to his feet. What does that tell us? Sadly, it tells us this, that the mantle that was on Elisha went to the grave. The anointing that the king was after, he didn't get, but the anointing did abide. But it's also a beautiful picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because at the end of his life, when it came time to bear the grief of mankind, it always bothered me. Why was the guy who did miracles sick with a sickness? Then when I read it and I checked the word, and I checked the word associated with Isaiah 53, I saw the type, I saw the, the connection that God was making, and I saw that he had borne the grief of that generation. And when the time had come and he'd borne that grief, he died. See, Jesus bore our grief and our sorrows. And he was put in a tomb. I'll give you a couple more verses. You ready? Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live new life. You know, that, that anointing, that anointing was there, that anointing for miracles, that anointing to raise the dead, it was still there. The anointing, it, it never goes away. That anointing sadly went to the grave, but you know, thank God that when Jesus went to the grave and when he was risen from the dead and he ascended to the Father, he said, Holy Ghost, the anointing that I had now, go dispense it on everyone. Got to praise the Lord over there, got a happy over there, got a couple of clock watchers, and one more verse, that's it. Romans 8, 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. It's not somewhere over there, somewhere over there. We don't have to go find it somewhere over there. The Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, it dwells in you. <laughs> And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit that is living in you. Well, that means that he'll raise us from the dead after we die. No, it means that the mortal body that you have is quickened every single day. Because the power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. And the power of that resurrection life is touching your body. And you're a living, breathing, walking dispenser of the benefits of the heavenly realm everywhere you go. Because the mantle, the mantle for miracles is on you. The mantle for miracles is on you. The mantle for miracles is on you. Amen.